you that your presence is among us in this service. Yes, have your way, have your say. Yes. We promise that we'll give you all the glory. And all the people that really, really, really love God said, All right. Well, people are still coming in, but I think this, because this is the growing service, what that means? It grows for the first 30 minutes. For the first 30 minutes. Because, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> How many of you know it's There's a challenge? There's a little shift that happens Isn't out in the parking Isn't it a challenge? Line. Yes, it is. It Isn't is. It? It's a challenge to get a parking stall. How many of you? Pretty soon we're going to have that parking lot, though, opened up over in front of the tabernacle. It's out of help. But we had, we had a, I'll say it like this. We had a first service fire. It was, it was, it was really great. powerful. God really came in and, and, uh, man, it was just a strong word that came from the so Lord, too. Good. So Oh, my goodness, yes. Did you like I, I Well, I'll just say I feel like you brought out, again, just the fact that, first of all, imprecatory prayers isn't just for out there. It's also our own stand against the enemy, right? So that's important. That's really important. And then you just talked about some other issues going yeah. on in the earth. And I was we talked about how many seen those commercials, uh, He Gets Us. Oh, we, we, how many of you ever seen the uh, Dice-O-Matic that they advertise? It dices, trices, uh, we, we, we diced and triced and, and we were nice, but we were biblical and brought it back. Cause it ain't about, he gets us. We need to get him. Amen. And, uh, yes. so it, it, I'm giving too much away. So I want to do this. I want to welcome those of you that are also watching around the world. And, uh, if you haven't, seen the first service go out later on archive right they yes. can go out to uh what is it one voice tv yes, dot net. net go there and you never know about social media they may have it disappear in cyberspace um but you can go it was a powerful prophetic word and the presence of god was very very strong yes, yes it was and uh the message um god kind of took me a different direction where we were really Hitting a lot but of But it was good. It was stuff. good. So, so many good scriptures. I was right. just blessed. I want to do this also. Those of you that are in the Nashville area or you're close, like, um, you know, United Kingdom or something, you want to fly in, You can, we're going to be at this, what's it called? NRB, which yeah. is the Na National is Religious, Religious Broadcasters, Broadcasters Convention. So we'll be there along with Pastor Gene Bailey, Victory, Flashpoint will be there. We'll have our own booth. Brenda. Yes, we'll be and there. Really, Game Changers has their own booth. Yes, they do. Amazing. Pastor Matt waving everybody, and yeah, it's so we're excited. And really, we got a really big booth this year because we're really yeah. kind of trying to let people know about OVTV. So the network, you know, we're working. Just so everybody knows, we're working more and more on turning it into a full-blown network. So right. little by little, you'll be seeing longer, full loops yeah. of live programming, and so. It's it's just going to keep continuing and that that's where especially all of you all out there that support the ministry thank you for undergirding OVTV but that's going to be our focus at NRB and this I year. want to encourage you those of you that are watching and you that are in here we're, we'll be broadcasting live so we're going to have special all throughout yeah yep. special guests are going to be on that we're going to be interviewing and it's it's really it's amazing. Be amazing and President Trump's going to be there Thursday night so that'll be That'll be interesting. Yes. So be to stay tuned. Yes, it's going to be good. All right. Are you excited you came to church? Good. All right. You know, we pray every morning that God will stir our spirits before we walk on campus. And so that's what I believe God's already doing in your life. So throw those hands up to heaven. Come on, wave them. And do it not just, you know, to God, but we're doing an act of agreement in the room right now. So, Lord, bind us together. Bring us into a place of unified vision, unified heart, that we'll hear the sounds of the kingdom of God moving in this room. So say these words. Say, Lord teach me today speak to me show me whatever you desire now say this say, I'm a sponge God I'm in receiving mode to whatever you want to do in this room in Jesus name now give God a huge praise as we worship him this morning we stand in your presence in all lifting our hearts in our hands to you, God. We worship you. We worship you. Oh God, how we love you. We honor you this day. We worship you.
know, in my heart, as I'm before the Lord with you, I just see in my heart, I believe something God is showing us, and, and it's something He wants to do. Whether you're watching today or you're in this room, I, it's like I see you hunched over. You're bent down like this. I mean, just kind of illustrate it. I see this in my heart. And you're weighed down. You've got the cares of this world. you got the care of your children, some of you, the care of your finances. Some of you are taking upon you the care, really, of what's happening in our country, in the earth. And it's weighing you down to the point where you've lost a sense of peace, a sense of joy, a sense of comfort because you're just you're weighed down and we have to be careful because the scripture talks about the spirit of weariness and the Bible says in the last days that the enemy would desire to do what to the Saints to the Christians where are you down and sometimes when we get ourselves in a position where we start thinking and and letting those cares and all the things that are happening on, is it a weigh you down? That's why I personally, I really try very hard not to listen to the news. Doesn't mean I don't look at a headline here and there before Flashpoint, you see what's going on. But here's the point. I'm not causing my soul, my mind, my emotions, my will to be subject to all the things that are happening. But I feel like that's where some of you are at. You are just really, really weighed down. And it's not that you're doing anything wrong. That's not my point. It's what God wants to do to make it right. And what he wants to do to make it right is he wants to lift your burdens. And he wants to release an anointing. So if you're here today, I'm going to have Pastor Brenda and Pastor Matt and almost and Pastor Doji and Chelsea. I want you guys to come up and just, you're going to go down a line together. But I want you, if that's you, come on up here very quickly and just line up. And these guys are going to pray for you. And they're going to release an anointing. Also, Anthony. Anthony's about to be Pastor Anthony soon. We're just waiting on the timing of the Lord. And uh, so if that's you, there might be just a few of you. I just want them to come on down and just gather around you. Listen, let them feel the strength of what happens. But I know that you're in here. There's more than one of you. You're just feeling the burden of things. And we just really want that lifted off of you. Let the oppressed go free, the scripture says. You know, I'm so grateful. Flashpoint gave Lance and I uh, Monday, Tuesday off. Man, I needed it. You know, I didn't realize being out in Rocky Mountain High, Colorado, no wonder they wrote a song about it. You can't breathe out there, man. So (laughs) I was out there and, you know, I told you I was running up those mountains about five miles up and about five miles down in my mind. Brenda, did you think I was running like that? All right, I want you to go down. I want them just to begin. You can go down a line or you could just begin to pray however you want to do it. Just kind of follow Pastor Brenda. Come on, Pastor Doji and everybody, just kind of follow them. Father, I'm going to pray for them right now as they pray. In the name of Yeshua, your word declares that the anointing destroys every yoke of bondage. That your anointing undoes every heavy burden. Lord, I pray right now that you would break the bands of wickedness. That you would come by your spirit not of our own might not of our own power but god by your spirit and break the bands of wickedness i'm asking you god to intervene now in the name of yeshua and let yokes be destroyed burdens be removed let the oppressed go free i speak this into the atmosphere whether they be in this room or whether they watch now or they watch later let this anointing be released now That they cast their cares upon you, for you care upon them. You care for them. And I pray, God, that you would touch them. Administer your grace. Administer your mercy. And cause divine help to come by the power of your right hand. Administer favor. And I pray from this moment forward, things will begin to change. Things will begin to shift. Things will begin to come into divine order. Things will begin to come into divine preservation. God, there will come a new season and a new hour that shall rest upon these people. A freedom that they've not experienced. A joy unspeakable and full of glory.
a peace that surpasses all understanding for the peace is the shalom of God himself come and rest upon these people and I command a divine turnaround now lastly I take authority over every evil spirit I say you get your hands off of these people in the sound of my voice for whatever is bound upon earth shall be bound in the court of heaven we bind every demonic operation we break the power of witchcraft we break the power of divination any altar where their names are being mentioned for evil or for assignments of the enemy or witchcraft we call upon the fire of God to disintegrate it and break it now in Yeshua's name and we loose upon them a new season we loose upon them a freedom father things are going to be lighter things are going to sense they're going to sense it's just like something is lifted because that burden has been removed that yoke has been destroyed because of the power of your Holy Spirit we worship you and we loose that now upon them man I just hear the Lord t- just whispering in my heart he just said and you tell him this that not only am I doing this but I have released angelic assistance I- I'm serious there's a lot of stuff going on up in here Lord thank you for angelic assistance thank you for ministering for the promise of the scripture is that the angels of God the host have been sent to minister for us who are heirs of salvation that's us it's it's our rightful uh, inheritance so thank you father as those angels are dispatched over every person's situation and over our lives thank you for angelic reinforcements that protect preserve and bring the blessings that have come from your throne exceedingly abundantly beyond all we could ask or think in Yeshua's name amen thank you thank you Lord thank you Lord we worship you thank you Lord isn't God good you know they always say what do they used to say when I I mean I've been serving God since like 84 they used to say um, when somebody would say God is good what do they say he's better than that Oh, all the time. I know that one, but they used to say, he's better. Than, what, did, what did they say? How do they say? He's even better than that. So, amen. All right. Praise God. Praise God. And I just feel something right here. There, in this area right here, I just sense that there is, a, there is something of heaven that is happening that has to do with provision. It's right in this area. I can sense that there's some things that... It's like right here, you all been praying for specifically. And I just feel a tremendous release of that right now, that you're going to be surprised how quickly the manifestation and the acceleration of the things that you desire are coming. In the name of Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. Over here, man, there's some things regarding your sleep. I can feel it. And I speak. And I declare that over your mind, your mind is blessed. Your mind is at peace. And I speak that your body rests. And that your sleep is restful in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I sense there's somebody in this line as well. You're getting ready. You are getting ready to sign something. And you backed away from it and you're not sure about it and I hear the Spirit of God this is the worst word because this is what I hear as I'm ready to move with Shiloh and God told me in a man all night long have you ever wrestled with God man I tossed and turned several months ago because God kept telling me wait 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 because I was trying to move forward on something he said wait wait and I, and I woke up and I said that's all you had to say to me is wait God you know I hate waiting I hate waiting but I'm telling you, I don't know which one of you, but you're get, you were getting ready to sign something. You backed away from it. But I'm telling you, the word of the Lord is you wait. Don't rush it. Don't sign it. I don't know why. I'm not trying to order your life, but God is trying to protect you. Just wait a little bit. Wait a little bit. They always say good things come to those that wait. I don't have time to believe that but but because I like to move fast. But I have learned, and I want to say this, God, in your honor. I've learned not only good things come to those that wait, but God things come to those that wait. Would you just come up here? I want to put my hand on you because I see a lot of things that the enemy is trying to do around you, but he is not going to be allowed. I speak a grace 
I speak of protection. Your heart is heavy. Your heart has been burdened. Your heart has been wounded. And there's been some unfair treatment, but unfair things. That's what the Lord is saying. It's been unfair. And you're like, God, I don't like it. I don't, I'm just tired. That's what you said out of your mouth. I'm just tired. And so the Lord wants you to know that as, this, as you feel my hand upon your head, I'm not trying to mess up your pretty hair, but God says my hand is on you. My hand is upon these situations that have hurt your heart, the season that it seems like you've been in, and it's been a tired season. But God says as you feel a hand upon you, know that it's my hand upon you that's going to turn things around for good. I see something around the month of July. I don't know if that's a significant month in your life or something. I don't know, but I just I feel July is very key for you. And the Lord's saying, just you have to know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. And the reason why the Lord is trying to tell you July is not because it's prolonging. He's just trying to tell you that's what God is doing. He's setting things up, not for your failure. He's not setting things up so that it can stay and remain the same. He's trying to give you a set time so that you understand that there is a process of God's grace that is being made manifest and at work in your life, that you're going to see the manifestation of it. And there is a freedom that comes in July, the 4th of July, but there's coming a freedom for you. And there's coming a new season, a new door. There is coming an absolute shift that's going to carry you from July forward into a new season. You're going to know it. You're going to recognize it. And it's going to be better than anything that you've experienced thus far. Because I see God like absolutely dealing harshly with spiritual entities that somehow they have been assigned to you in a very vigorous way. But so is the hand of God. It is your defense and as your restorer. Bless her. Just take a deep breath and let the blessing of God come. I don't know. I just feel like your summer is like a birthday. It's going to be a birthing forth of something new. I don't know if that applies in the natural, but it sure does in the spirit. I can see it. All right. Well, you all are great. Let me see if there's anything else. I just want to put my hand on you here. Would you, would you come? Father, I just put my hand on her in the name of Yeshua. And I thank you. You don't have to accept things as they are. There's been certain things prognosticated, certain things that have been declared. But God says, I'm intervening, and you're going to see the proof. And it's going to manifest first in your soul, where you're going to feel something settled in your soul, for you've always been a great daughter of faith, the Spirit of God says. But you're going to feel a settling, not just in your spirit, but in your emotions. You're going to feel it settling in your mind that you know that you know that you know that even though there's reports, it's the report of the Lord that stands and you know that in your spirit, but your soul is going to settle it. And when this happens in your soul, it's just like, it's just like you're going to be so, people are going to think you're stubborn, but you're not stubborn. You're right. And you're standing in the facts. And when you stand in the facts, you stand in truth. And because of that, you're going to see the manifestation over your physical body. And you're going to see it. It's going to come within. I see it like in your midsection. You're going to see it operate around your, your chest. All of this area, the hand of God is going to gloriously move. And then it's going to begin to just, it, you're going to feel a sensation. Where the Spirit of God says, I'll even let you feel what fire feels like. You're going to feel a tremendous sense of heat. And God says, this is my presence that is burning out the report, burning out symptoms, burning out that which the enemy would seek to do at this time. But you have stood, and now you will feel my fire that stands, and you will see the manifestation of what you have stood for. Thank you, Lord. I don't even know what that means, but do you have any clue? Okay. All right, good. All right, anybody else? Let's just wait here. Thank you, Lord. I want you to come here because 
I just feel in my spirit real strong. This is what God's doing right now with you. I want you to look at me for a minute. Because you just are in a you're just in a season right now. You're like, I'm done. But God is going like this. See my hand? He's reaching for you. And his hand is extending towards you. And God says, My arm is not short, that it cannot save you, deliver you, touch you. And there is a family thing that God is doing. And you're gonna see it. Doesn't look like it. You've prayed, you've asked God. And there has been some stubbornness, running, slamming of doors. But God says, this is about to shift. And as I reached for you, I'm reaching for your family. And as you feel that, man, as you feel this hand touch you, God says, this will be what you feel with your family as they reach back out to you. And there will be tenderness again, understanding, communication, and differences will be put aside. And years of pain and strife, division, stubbornness, God says in a moment, it will be wiped away. I pronounce this upon you and over you and for you. I don't know, when I touch you, I just heard the name Tori. Does that mean anything to you, Tori? Anybody here, Tori? Is anybody Tori? No? I don't know, I just heard the name Tori. Don't, I don't even know what that means, but anyway. If it doesn't relate, I just want to be a Christian in my heart. But pay attention to that name. I don't know why, but pay attention. Because it's going to be very significant. Father, we worship you. We honor you. Thank you, Lord. Someone in this line is being healed of of, uh, something in your diaphragm. And it goes up. It's like reflux. And God is healing that right now. Let's just thank the Lord for all that he's doing. God, we worship you and we bless you. This is your time, not ours. Thank you for touching the people. Thank you for blessing the people. We honor you today. How many love the Lord? Man, I love him very much. Well, why don't you do this? Why don't you go back to your seats? God bless you. Give somebody a high five as as they go back. And then I want you to turn around and greet someone and say, I bet I know what you want for your birthday. See how close you are. All right? God bless you. Pastor Hank. Thanks, Pastor Matt. All right, you can be seated. Make sure you smile at somebody so that they know you're nice. <laughs> or you're a kind. How about that? You're kind. Nice is conformity. You're, you're, you're kind, right? Kind. Kindness is the fruit of the Spirit. Nice is, is conformity, usually, because you're so nice, you just want to make everybody happy, right? And it doesn't mean if you compromise your principles, you're just going to be nice, right? But that's not us. That's not me. All right, oh boy, if I'm going to preach the way I preached in the first service, I better have better than that or I'm going to get sassy. Is it, oh, thank you. I just needed that amen right there. (laughs) That's like the new modern amen. Let me hear the new modern amen. Yep. Back in the old days, they just said amen. And then the really old days, if you're fossils, it was like you didn't say anything. You were not allowed to say anything in church. If you even said, hey, that's true uh, in church, the ushers would haul you out, right? You were told when to speak. Remember that? And they used to write in the little bulletin, and you'd follow along, and then it'd be, he'd say something, then you'd say, Lord, hear our prayer, (laughs) or something like that. Now, you know, people got more mouthy. Yeah, that's what social media is about. We can all comment. Let everybody know our feelings, right? Okay. 
Hey, I do want to mention, uh, if you are, again, down in Nashville, come by and see us at our booth at NRB. It's going to be a blast. I can't wait. It's going to be an exciting week. And um, one thing that we are going to do, and, and I can't wait to show this to you. So next Sunday, I'm going to show you. So how many of you know, 25 years ago, I created like almost, I don't know, 40 cartoon characters. And uh, that's what I wanted to do for our I went into the ministry. I thought that's what I was supposed to do is be a cartoonist. And I also want to be a sports announcer. Wouldn't that have been cool? The voice of Nebraska, Hank Kuhneman, man. I, I know. No, I would have been too ornery. You guys fumbled. What's up with you? Get off, get on the sideline. You know, I mean, I probably wouldn't have been good. But anyway, so next week I've, I've started, um, I have four cartoon series that I've been working on because, you know, I really want to save a generation. And as you know, I've already put my Captain Zepto uh, comic books uh, into animation uh, with one video. I've got three more coming out this year. We've been working really hard, man. And I got a guy that used to write for VeggieTales. He also wrote uh, the movie Hoodwink. Do you ever remember Hoodwink, that cartoon? Anybody see that? One and two. He was award winning. He's one of my writers now. And we sit down and we work on stuff together. Norris is a tremendous illustrator. But I have a new series coming out. It's um, called the uh, uh, P.I. Gus, Detective at Large. And uh, it, it, I, I'm putting it in 3D animation. And wait till you see these guys in 3D. It is so good, and it shows, so I'm going to show that next week. But then I have a, another series, Secret Agent Sue, down on the bottom for little girls. And it is really creative. Uh, I've been having um, Pastor Shane and Christie's daughters been helping me with some ideas, and so I've been writing them. You know, uh, Paul Krauss was here, and he said, how do you find time for this? I said, you know, when I get inspired, I just I just I write stuff down on my phone, I write stuff on napkins, and then I'll put it together so that I stay up with it. But we are juggling a lot, so we do appreciate your prayers. Um, but let's get into the Word, and I can't wait to share this. We are putting this, by the way, in a book. Many of you have been asking for us, um, so I had to kind of interrupt another book I've been working on, but we're, we're going to get this out. So I want you to look at Luke chapter 11. And we're talking about imprecatory prayers. Now, you might say, what in the world is that? Imprecatory literally means bless, uh, prayers that evoke um, the justice of God, the judgment of God. It's uh, what Israel learned. How many remember in your Bible when God came in Genesis 12 to Abraham? And he cut covenant with him, and he said something. Those of you that are watching, he said these words. And Israel knew this. And it was, blessed are those who bless you. But watch this. Cursed be those that curse you. In other words, if you mistreat Israel, God said you're going to invoke an imprecatory deal. And that's it. You're going to bring God's justice. Israel also knew because when the Ten Commandments were given to Moses, God made them go up on two mountains and he split the tribes and he said, all right, you guys go up on the one mountain, the others go up on the other mountain. And he said, on this mountain over here, you declare all the things that are curses. In other words, if you disobey me, if you don't do my word, then these things are a result. And so they had to speak it and they said, Lord, we will honor you. Then on the other side, he's like, hey, I got good news. If you just walk in my ways and serve me, these are the blessings. How many remember that? So they understood blessing and curses. They understood when you do what's right, God blesses you. But when you do what's wrong, we reap what we sow. And this is why evil is so wicked today. It's what Isaiah 61 says, that um, uh, rise, shine, for the light has come. Darkness has covered the earth. And watch this, gross darkness has covered the people. Have you ever seen in your life, this level of gross darkness before. But here's the good news. You keep reading that uh, chapter in Isaiah 61. It says, but God shall arise. And many and the king shall come to the brightness of his rising. So there's good news. It may look evil, but God is arising. So we have to understand that we've never seen evil at this level before. But the problem is if we just ignore it and we just, you know, conform to it and let it continue to do what it's doing... It, it begins to affect so many areas. And look at what it's done. It's even come down to the point where it's touched our children. And we cannot keep ignoring it. We have to stand. And this is what I want to show you. There's only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God. And there's the kingdom of Satan. And they are both wanting to infiltrate 
the kingdoms of this world. Both of them are wanting to come and have the, the say. And how many of you believe that God should have the final say? Amen. All right, so I want you to look at Luke chapter 11. And it came to pass when Jesus was praying that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, watch this, and I want you to underline this because I believe this is the word of the Lord. Now, we heard a prophecy this morning that is the word of the Lord, but I believe if God is emphasizing anything right now, this is the answer. People say, well, I'm not going to vote in 2024 because, you know, they've already stole it before. What's the use? These people are, are never are brought to justice. Wickedness keeps prevailing. Well, as long as you keep speaking that and coming into agreement, you are, you are actually uh, helping to empower this satanic kingdom. Because both kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of darkness operate by words. Right? And so if you keep speaking wrong and you keep saying that, then you're only being an enforcer for the enemy to continue to kill, steal, and destroy. But what we have to do, notice what happens. Disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Underline that. I believe that's the word of the Lord. God is trying to teach his people right now how to pray. I was uh, teasing the first service, and I love something, man. I know you guys are going to think I'm crazy. I love Kraft macaroni and cheese out of the box. Yes, I do, Brent. I wouldn't mind some, but I'm trying to, you know, behave myself. But I'll tell you, I like that, and I also like this stuff called shake and bake chicken. I know that sounds, how many of you, okay, raise your hands and be a person of honor. You kind of like shake and bake. How many of you, you would never in your entire life touch that stuff? But you can go find an old dead squirrel, and, and you can put it in the shake and bake sauce and put it in the bag and shake it up. And, man, you'd have shake and bake dead squirrel. It, it tastes like shake and bake squirrel. It all tastes the same. You can put, man, you can put a possum in there. Those of you in Texas, you know what I'm talking about. I heard you all eat armadillos and te- uh, possums and stuff like that, right? If you live up north, you all eat fish, Right? If you're down south, it's all, you know, oxtails, which I love oxtails. I know it's too close to a certain area, but I love it. I love oxtails. <laughs> Brenda makes them incredible. I know it sounds gross, but man, how many of you have ever had oxtails? Oh, there you go. You guys know good soul food, man. And then, you know, I like that stuff that looks like you mowed your lawn and, and you put it in this big old pot. It's called greens. So it's like you. But anyway, let's get back to the point. Shake and bake. Prayer is not shake and bake. Prayer is not, you know, we're just going to put everything in one little thing, shake it up, and it's called prayer. There's different types of prayer, but the problem is the church, the body of Christ, has been stuck in one vein of prayer for a long time. And Jesus, when he taught, he said, he said ask, and you would what? Receive. Everybody seems to have the ask part down. There's not one Christian that I know of that doesn't know how to ask. Now, it doesn't mean they get their prayers answered, but they sure know how to ask, Right? But what we've lacked is we've lacked the seeking part because he said, ask, seek, and knock. We've we've lacked the seeking part. We don't even know how to seek God. You know, that's why in worship, you look at people in worship and you can, you're not judging them, but you're like, come on, man, are you even trying? How hard is it to lift your hands? How hard is it to close your eyes? You do when you sleep. It's not hard, you know, so close your eyes and focus on God. But then there's another part, knock, and that word knock, ask, seek, and knock. You notice it's the A-S-K, and it spells ask. But ultimately, it's how you have different dimensions of prayer. You, you got to know how to ask, and there's called supplications, praying the word. You got to know how to seek. How do you worship God to where you get his attention? Right? Where he, he just he opens up the treasures of heaven and he pours out blessings upon you that you don't even have room to receive because you've touched his heart through worship. Amen. I've had many times where I've worshiped God and I've asked him for nothing. And I'm getting ready to leave my prayer room. He's like, don't leave. What can I bless you with? I'm like, Lord, I did not come in here to ask you for anything. I wanted to bless you. But then, you know what? If he's in a good mood <laughs> and he's wanting to... To, to bless me because I touch his heart, bring it on. And that's when I pray also for you. But then there's knocking, which is like spiritual warfare. How many of you remember The Battering Ram? One of my favorite movies of all times is The Princess Bride. I don't know why I like that movie. Remember that guy? You thought that I thought that you thought inconceivable. Remember that? That's one of my favorite guys. I do that to irritate my wife all the time. She'll say... I'll say, what's for dinner? She'll tell me, inconceivable, you know, just because I could. 
How many, are you all here? I thought I had the sassy church. I'm kind of getting in my zone here, you know. You all, let me hear your amen. amen. See, that's the new amen. All right, there you go. But you remember that one part when they're trying to get the door and that big Andre, the giant, everybody move out of the way, you know, and they knock the door down of the castle or whatever it is. That's what you do in prayer. That's what it means when you have imprecatory prayers. You are taking a position that you are not taking no for an answer. You are tired of the wickedness that's trying to mess with your life, mess with your children, mess with the school boards, mess with the culture, mess with traditional marriage, mess with... What God said was only two, and that is male and female, nothing else. You ain't no cat. I don't care how many times you set your litter box up, you dirty little thing. You know, get it out of my bathroom, right? If you want to go put it up in your yard, and then when you're done, kick your feet up, you know, and got your, you know, that's up to you, but don't you be putting it in the bathroom that I'm around. That's just disgusting, Right? You know, you can, if you're a dude, you can dress yourself up like a woman all day long. You can alter yourself through surgery, but you still have a prostate. You can be a woman. You can doctor yourself up, change your plumbing. But how, what, how do you explain your uterus and your ovaries? Trust the science. You are not here today. It's the truth. This is why this is ridiculous. All right, let's go on to Luke 11. Came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. We need to learn how to pray. Now, here's what he teaches. Notice what he preaches. Now, you've got to see this. Jesus begins in verse 2, and he says, when you pray, the first thing you do is what God had said to, to me to tell his people, and that was this regarding 2024. He said, tell the people to draw closer to the Lord. And the second is buying the thief. So notice what he mentions the first thing is drawing close to God, respecting and howling the name of God. You know, we live in a culture today that people are pushing God out on every turn. It's amazing, like uh, Blaine said, you can be another religion and they don't even touch you. But they try to eliminate Christianity. They're always constantly trying to mess with our Jesus. They're trying to mess with our Christmas. They're trying to mess with things that relate to the one and only true God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. How many understand that? And so we have to draw close. We have to be people who say, you know what, God, I want to know you and I'm not satisfied knowing about you. But notice the second thing. This is imprecatory. This is where you are invoking the justice of God and his righteousness. He said, when you pray, first thing you do is you draw near to God. But the second is you take your place, your authority, and you say, thy kingdom come. Now, how many of you know when people are in war or they're trying to take over a territory, they put a flag down that says, you know what, we're taking over because it's an imprecatory act of thy kingdom come, whatever that nation is or whatever that empire is. I was teased in the first service this morning. How many of you are married? Man, I'll give you an example of that kingdom come. I've been married 35 years, and man, Brenda showed up, and it was that kingdom come. I mean, I never worried about the toilet seat. I didn't care if it was up or down. You are not here today. I'm really preaching. But now I'm a gentleman, and I always close it, but I'm like, Brenda, it takes more action to do this than it does just to leave the dumb thing up. You know, but it was thy kingdom come. If you come to my house, it's thy kingdom come. It ain't Hank's decorations. I, I didn't choose flowers for pictures that hang on walls. I didn't put candles on every corner. I didn't put pink and frou-frou frilly uh, drop cloths or whatever they are. You know, on couches and stuff like that. That's not my choosing. I mean, if I had my choice, I'd go get my hammers and screwdrivers and my train layout stuff. I'd get pictures of the dogs. I'd hang them on the walls. Come on, man. Let me hear you grunt. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. But thy kingdom came. Brenda came. She established her kingdom. And before she came, I was a pig, man. No, let me finish. Women, all right. You got to finish here. Finish. All right, before Brenda, thy kingdom of Brenda came, 
I didn't care, man. I just threw my clothes around and stuff like that at 18. I was married at 22, or just, no, I just turned 23. I didn't care. I just threw stuff around. But when Doc Kingdom of Brenda came, she put the flag down. Man, I'm a nice guy now. I, I put the, the toothpaste lid back on. I closed the toilet lid. I let her hang up whatever she wants. And then how about this thing? This is this weird object that is in our house. And I really don't even know what it's for, but it's on your bed. And it has flowers. And, 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 and it's fluffy. And, and it covers the top of the bed. But you can't touch it. You can't sleep on it. You, 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 you can't fold it. Don't get any dirt on it. No dirt. Three German ships and a Shih Tzu can't touch it. And it's just this weird object, but that's because thy kingdom of Brenda has come. So how many understand what's imprecatory? How many understand? There's only two kingdoms. Kingdom of God, kingdom of the devil. And when it comes to your family, your marriage, it's the kingdom of Brenda. And, you know, and I'm complimenting her because she's amazing and she's really changed me. I had a guy one time tell me one of the best compliments I ever had, Brenda. You know what he said to me? He said, Hank, you're a good man. I said, thank you. He goes, but I can tell why you're a good man. I don't think he's going to say, oh, your relationship with God. He says, you have been wifed. So thank you. I've been wifed. All right, let's go on. Look at Psalm 58, verse 6. You all still aren't here. You all are too quiet. There's an amen. All right, now look. All right. Look at Psalm 58. We want to talk about imprecatory prayers. So Israel understood what it meant to bless and curse. They understood what it meant to invoke the justice of God. They, they understood what that meant. Look at Psalm 58. David, in fact, how many remember the old song we used to sing? Thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. You're the glory. You're the lifter of my head. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that... Uh, Rise up against me, Psalm 3. And it's only eight verses long, but they eliminate, in the songwriters of today, they eliminate verse 7 that says, shatter the teeth of the wicked. They didn't put that in the song because they don't think that it somehow applies. It's not Christian. And so uh, what they have to realize is, though, that's not the way that the, that the uh, Hebrew, the children of Israel, they understood that, man, God was wanting to do something about evil. Now, we're not talking about calling your neighbor out. We're not talking about having an imprecatory heart or attitude towards your neighbor. Lord, if they don't move, move. Well, you can pray that kind of stuff because I have. I've prayed people out before. We had, a, we had a neighbor one time, and I don't know if you're watching, but I know you did get it right, where they were committing adultery right out in the middle of the open. The guy that lived across the street with the girl that lived next door. And she would get out there in summer hot, 100-degree weather in in what she thought was sexy leggings, and she'd stand out on the corner like this. I thought, what are you, a prostitute? And she would stand there waiting for him to come home. And I said to Brenda, I said, Brenda, I am not going to tolerate this underneath my watch. And then he would go for bike rides at 1030 at night, and she would go for a bike ride two separately about 20 minutes later. Well, you knew something was happening. You know what I'm saying? And I'm thinking, both of them have kids. This isn't good. God, I command that the Spirit of God gets involved and that these two repent. And if they don't repent and they harden their hearts, that you get rid of them. Yeah. And it got to the point one day that I was uh, out in my house and he, he said something to me and I said something to him, you know, in return. I said, you know, you got you to gotta live right. Well, he thought he could grab a hold of me. and He was a big dude, but he realized you better not touch me. And that boy was on the ground and my fist was in his face. I know. And I was a preacher. But you touch, you, uh, you drew first blood. And you only have four cheeks, you know, so I had turned many with this guy. But the thing, and the neighbor came out, and I, he ran when he saw that, and I'm like, you just need to get off my property and go. And I knew at that point I wasn't wrestling against flesh and blood. And so I, I, I prayed, and they left. They, the, both families, it, it, was, it was weird within a few months. Because I'm like, no, this is the neighborhood of righteousness. I'm not, I'm asking you to bless them, God. I'm asking you to do something. But here's the thing, I'm not going to tolerate this. And that's a different situation. What we're talking about is those that are bent on evil. For example, do you know that the homosexual community, the LGBTQ, RS, uh, TVD, whatever the initials are, you know, they're bent, and they're only like 2% of the population. But they want to make you think that they're half of America or more than half of America. That's trying to get you to 
bend towards something that is against what God has put in his holy word about how he defines marriage. God, Jesus defined it. You could read it in the book of Matthew. He defined marriage as between one man, one woman, right? That's what Jesus said. So if God declares it, then I'm sorry, but that's what we have to uphold to as followers of Yeshua. And so there's always those that are bent on evil. You have the transgender community. They're not even 1% that are now making it to the point where if your kid comes to you, you have no longer parental consent or say if your child decides that they want to go in and have surgery to change their gender. You have no say. That's what they're pushing for. This is the kind of level of evil. And we have to understand, look at Psalm 58, verse 6. David said this, break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. How many know there's a lot of things that are trying to put its bite, its mouth on our children, its mouth on our culture, its mouth in our legislation, its mouth, uh, come on, is trying to change uh, pronouns in the way that we say things. For example, you can't say that someone is brave anymore according to the woke dictionary because that brave is also the word savage and you are a savage person. Okay, it's ridiculous. They did that in the Tower of Babel. Oh, we're all one language. It's our language and we're going to do whatever we want to build what we want before uh, Nimrod, who we set up as our king. He's our tyrant. It's his say. We're of one language. And they all began to gather, right? It was their way. And God came down and said, ain't your way. I'm Yahweh, not your way. And there's a difference. Which, by the way, he's Yahweh, not your way. So these goofy commercials, he gets us, is a lie. This is not about Jesus coming down because he gets you. And if you notice their commercial at the Super Bowl, it's amazing how they, they, they didn't want to be political, but they were political. They took all the political hot buttons. They put somebody who was a transgender up, somebody that was a homosexual, somebody that was a political activist, right? They, they, they went for broke. And that Jesus gets you. No matter who you are, no matter what you want to stand for, even if it opposes his kingdom and his moral law, he conforms to you. That's what they're saying. And what that is, is progressive Christianity. In other words, you all are old school. You all are a bunch of ignorant people. You all are religious. We can redefine your rainbow when it used to stand for covenant. It still does, by the way. It's God's rainbow. We're going to rechange it because we're progressive. And it's, it's, you have to be open-minded. You have to be open-minded. Sounds like open borders. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus stood up in Matthew 7 and he said this. This isn't about open borders. It isn't about being open-minded, being progressive. So progressive Christianity leads to what's called permissive Christianity. In other words, he accepts me, he gets me, so I can, it's permitted. If I want to be a homosexual, I can be a homosexual. If I, if I want to be a transgender, I can be a transgender. If, I, if I'm a liar, I can be a liar. If, I, if I'm an uh, adulterer, you could stay an adulterer. If I'm a fornicator, I can stay a fornicator. If I'm a thief, I can stay a thief because he gets me. It's not just, you need to be progressive. You know what they want you to do? They want you to progress in their lies. They want you to progress in their false narratives. They want you to progress in changing the moral law of God's word and his spirit and what has been written in our hearts. And every human being is the ability to know right from wrong. Look at Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse 21 and 22. This is why people who say, well, it's my life. They don't know what they're doing. No, you know what you're doing. People who are bent on evil, they know what they're doing. You know what you're doing. That's why Romans 1 verse 20 says that no man is going to stand before God with an excuse. You need to read the book of Romans. Paul lost his own life. They cut off his head, Nero did, in Rome because he wrote a letter to the Roman church because they were buying into the homosexual agenda that was being perpetrated throughout the Roman Empire. And they were trying to infiltrate it into the church through Constantine and different ones and and adopting paganism. And, And they were also bringing transgender in. You can read all of this in the book of Romans. In every human being is the knowledge of their creator. 
People often say, well, what about that person over in the other country? In every person, you are created in the image of God. In every person, there is the image of God on the inside of you that is trying to reconnect with your creator. That's why once you are born again, the spirit of God and your own spirit, both the scripture says, cries out. You know when it cries out? Not only does the spirit cry out, but so does your spirit. Abba, Father, I finally come home, Dad. I've been separated, but Yeshua paid the price. That's why when I was five years of age, I was on, on the island of Guam in front of my parents' station wagon. They called them bombs. Uh, they called them, what do they call them? Guam bombs. Guam bombs because, you know, you would go get, because uh, the salt was so bad, they rust out your car. And so you would just, you know, paint over it with spray cans and hope your car lasted. But you never would ship your car from the States over there. It would be eaten in a minute. And so we had these Guam bombs. My dad would stand out there with 100 spray cans and spray paint cars. But I was in front, five years of age, in front of the station wagon. And I was looking up at the clouds. And they were a weird cloud formation. I know this day. And all of a sudden, I looked up. I thought, who made those clouds? I don't know why I thought that. I was like, man, I want to know what made those and who made that. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice, and I don't know if it was on the outside or if it was on the inside, but I heard it. It was loud enough, in a childlike way, spoke to me and said, my hand is on your life. And something on the, that was in, in a child's understanding about doing good. It scared me. It brought a holy fear where I was always checking before I did stuff. Looking at that hand, I'd go into public places and people would say, God's hands on you. I'm like, man, they are freaking me out. I know that's what I heard. But it was part of helping to keep my, my conscience in line so that at 18 years of age, I could give my life to the Lord. But look at Genesis 3.21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin. That's after they sinned. Notice it's plural, coats, skin, and clothe them. Look at verse 22. Here's why no man shall stand before God with an excuse. The LGTB community, the transgender community, the loony liberals of the left, the, the, the Republican excuse rhinos, ultimately every human being knows right from wrong. There is not one person in here that you will have an excuse before God to say that you didn't know what you were doing. Or you didn't know it was evil. Look at what God said. And the Lord God said to the man or mankind, Behold, now mankind is as one of us. And mankind from this moment forward will know good and evil. They are without excuse. You're without excuse. This is why when people tell you, stay out of politics. Well, wait a minute. If you don't, if you don't involve yourself in legislation and who gets elected and what's being uh, elected and what's being legislated, bills that are being passed, if the church removes themselves from it, then my question is, where is the opposing challenging kingdom that sets a moral standard? Because what we call politics today is nothing more than moral issues. Abortion. We call it politics. Since when is killing a baby in the womb and out of the womb a political issue. It's a moral issue. Because God said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, Before I put you and formed you in your mother's womb, I, your creator, knew you. God gave Israel a choice. This isn't about, you know, uh, pro-choice. There's no choice. It's about life. And life begins with God. So you have no right to take life. Now, it's different if you are defending your home, you're defending your nation. That's not murder. It's called self-defense. But what did that child do to you that you chose to go down the road you did? Yeah, but what if they were raped? Is it still a child? Child didn't do it. Did, it, did, did, did women who got raped put their kids up for adoption, and those children are thriving today? So we want to always bend towards, it's my choice, it's my body, it's my right. Wait a minute. You know good from evil. You know right from wrong. 
So ultimately, on the inside of you, you know if it's right or wrong. You knew it was wrong when you went in the back seat with that person and did what it takes to produce that child that you want to abort. You knew it was wrong to run off with your secretary. You knew it was wrong to have premarital sex. Ultimately, your conscience told you. You knew it. That's why you told the gentleman five times, no, no, no. And he kept saying, yes, 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 or vice versa. You know in your heart. So we make it a political issue. It's a moral issue. You don't murder. You don't kill a little child. Right? And the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. Let's get back to he gets us. Well, first of all, you mean to tell me that you're going to look in the face of Jesus and you're going to say that he doesn't get it? Because that's what you're saying. He gets us. Anything goes. No, he already got us. He already got us to the point where the Bible says that the Trinity of God before the earth, the foundation of it was very even formed, that the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost got together and they began to agree, saying, if we make man in our image, one of us are going to have to go and pay the price because they're going to sin. And Jesus said, I'll go. I'll be the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. I will go and I will shed my blood. We cheapen the blood of Yeshua by saying he gets it and that it's our way. You conform to us, God. No, he already came down. He absolutely ministered to sinners. And by the way, he only washed the feet of his disciples. He didn't wash the feet of the Pharisees. He didn't wash the feet of the sinners. You know what he told everybody, especially those in sin? He didn't say, I get you. He said, sin no more. He said in John chapter 5, the man at the pool of Bethesda, 38 years, John 5, he's sick for 38 years. He said, you are healed. Take up your bed and go, lest a worse thing come upon you. How about John chapter 8? Let's look at John chapter 8. Let's just go there for a minute. I don't know why. Let's just go go to verse 1. John 8, verse 1. Let's just read this. Some of you have ever heard the story of the the woman caught in the midst of adultery. He didn't condemn her. See, he gets us. No, he already got us. That's why he shed his blood. That's why he's the crucified lamb. That's why he died on that old rugged cross. Because he was saying, I get you. I get that you all are in need of a savior. It doesn't matter if you're a transgender, homosexual, liar. If you're a thief, a robber. If you're bitter. If you're um, uh, offended. Come on. Whatever your state is. Even if you think you're a good person. I got you enough already that I came and I died. Now you need to get me. I don't conform to your kingdom. You conform to my kingdom. That's what Jesus said. Seek first my kingdom and his righteousness and all things will be out. He didn't say I get you so, you know, I'm just going to conform to your ways. No, look at the way. Not just back before we go to John 8. Look at Acts 17, 30. I'll prove it to you. Acts 17, verse 30. Look at what the scripture says. At the times of this ignorance, God winked. He winked. But he ain't winking. That's why he's not winking at that commercial. It grieves the Spirit of God. It misrepresents Jesus. Now, that's not hate. It's called righteousness. It's called, it's Yahweh. It's God's way. And it ain't about your way. Otherwise, why did any of us repent? Why did any of us turn? If we could just do whatever, be whatever. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6... It says no homosexuals, liars, blah, 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 shall enter in the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. Notice emphasis were. Paul didn't bring a pass. Why is it okay for somebody to be a homosexual to come into the church, which, you know, churches always advertise, come as you are, which is true. People should be allowed to come tatted. They should be allowed to come, right, as they are. But nobody is to stay as they are. I don't care if you never thought about dressing up like a woman or a dude. If that's not your issue, you can come as you are, but don't think that you're so goody-goody that you don't have to change either. Jesus' core message was, you can read it in the book of Luke, 
chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, his message was repent, change your ways, conform to my kingdom. He commissioned his disciples in Luke 10. He said, I'm sending you out and here's your core message. Preach the kingdom. Preach, repent, and declare the kingdom of God's at hand. You tell everybody, no matter what their condition is, they are not good enough on their own. And they're not so evil that they can't change. Doesn't matter if they're a transgender. Doesn't matter if they're homosexual. You're not too evil to change. We are all commanded to repent. Acts 17, 30, in the times of his ignorance, God winked at. But now, now, notice this is not a suggestion. This is not a suggestion. The problem with the he gets it message is it's a suggestion. And really it's not a suggestion. It's, it's pretty much this is the way it is and you just need to, 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 to live with it. It's not about your ways. There, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to man, but the way thereof is death. The way of a transgressor is hard. The Bible says, depart from me in Matthew 7, you worker of iniquity. You never knew me. This isn't about us. It's not about our ways. That's why open borders is a joke. Because you know what Jesus taught in Matthew 7? He said, narrow is the way that leads to life. You know why you close your borders? It protects the life of your citizens. Right? Doesn't allow terrorists to just come across and do what they want to do. Right? In the, in the, in the very word border, you take the B away and what do you get? Order. God's a God of order. It's why when you go, people make jokes about the pearly gates. Peter's standing at the pearly gates. Wait, 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 wait. If you're so much about open borders, why don't you change your joke? You mean there's actually gates in heaven? Because God understands order. You cannot get in to heaven. There's an order and there's a right way. And it's only one way to get to heaven. It's his way. It ain't about he gets it. He already got it. You need to get him if you want to come. It's his way. And that's why he said, I'm the only way. I'm the only truth. And I'm the only life. That's what Jesus said. So you have to understand that. But it ain't open borders. It's about order. You know why God, Jesus said this in Matthew, the book of Matthew. He said marriage is between one man and one woman. Because in a man and a woman who have the right equipment to be fruitful and multiply. If you put a bunch of men on an island that love each other, on Easter Island, guess what? They're going to become extinct. You put a bunch of women that love each other on an island, guess what? They're going to be extinct. Because God understood order. And the only way to keep things from getting out of control to where you think anything goes, you can marry whatever you want, you can be whatever you want, I have to establish that there's only two, male, female, and the only way in marriage is between one man and one woman, nothing else that's called closed borders. It's called God's way so that it doesn't hurt you or others that get caught in the crosshairs of getting outside of that order. That's why Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to heaven. But open borders is the way that leads to hell. That's what he said. That's why the book of Isaiah said that hell is open wide its mouth. That's what they want you to do. Just open yourself up. And guess what Jesus said? You have an open border, open mind. It's all progressive. It's all woke. Anything goes. We cannot judge. No, Jesus didn't say you couldn't judge. He said you could look at a tree and you can tell what kind of tree it is by its fruit. So you have a right to judge people's actions called their fruit. You have a right to judge what people are doing with what their said lifestyle is. And deem it as moral or immoral. What he's saying is don't judge pointing your finger at somebody if you are guilty about the very thing that you are pointing. And he's also, Matthew 5, verse 41 through 44, he's saying love your enemies and those that despitefully use you. He's not talking about having personal judgments and issues with people. But he didn't say you couldn't speak out against opposing forces. Special interest groups and things that are trying to mutilate your children and sexually exploit them in schools. Or try to change your, 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 your words 
and your English vocabulary, whatever nation you're in, just to uh, support their bent, immoral ways. Because you start changing the language, guess what? They're in control, and it's whatever they define something, that's what goes. That's why he doesn't get us. He already got us, and he established his kingdom, and he says, you better get me. It's my way, and all men, look at Acts 17, 30. i got to come back to this verse, I almost forgot. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at, put it up. But now he commands what? All men. I don't care what your condition is. There's no one righteous, no, not one. We have all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. All men everywhere are to what? Repent. Repent. And notice they never said that in their commercials. Because they want you to believe progressive Christianity. Which becomes permissive Christianity where God gives permission for me to be immoral. No, he doesn't. Paul preached a lot about immoral. He told his young uh, preacher Timothy, flee youthful lusts. Okay? He, he, no, it's God's way. And the Ten Commandments, they take off our, our courtroom doors. They take them out of our parks. But it doesn't mean that they can take them from ultimately what is written on your heart. Amen. And that is Genesis 3.22. God said, now mankind from this moment forward will always know good from evil. Don't listen to people who want to make you think they don't know what they're doing. Or they're innocent in their evil. Oh, no. That's why somebody's got to show them the better way. And people call it hate speech. But you know what scripture says? Love does what? Shows a better way. And you're to speak the truth in what? So you stay in love, but you don't back away from speaking truth. You speak truth in love, but you tell the truth. Because there's only two kingdoms. It's either Yahweh or their way that a lot of times is bent on evil. Problem with Christianity today, can I tell you what it is? Too many Christians are not, they're not white in the sense of this. I'm not talking about color of skin, so don't call me a white supremacist just because I'm white. I can't help that I'm white. You can't help that you're brown. You can't help that you're yellow. And here's what I want to say. We all talk about racism. How stupid. I know black people that don't want to lay out in the sun because they want to get more white. I know white people that want to go lay out in the sun because they want to get more dark skin. This is all stupid. I didn't hear an amen. No. So here's the thing. We are commanded to go, to go righteous. There's white robes, meaning righteousness, purity, holiness. We separate ourselves unto God. You know what the problem is with the church? It's what Jesus said causes him to vomit. He said, if you're lukewarm, a little bit of hot, a little bit of cold, but you're right there in the middle. You know, have you ever been driving down the road, especially in Texas? The middle of the road is the most dangerous place to be. It's called roadkill. It's called lukewarm Christianity. And the problem is churches and, and have become, and preachers have become so middle of the road. Well, I can see God's point, but I can also see their point. Really? It's God's way. And I'm not here to try to compromise what he said. I'll stay in love, but I'm going to stay with what God said. There isn't gray area. So what we have is we have secular Christianity today. You know what secular Christianity is? It calls evil good, and if you stand for what is good, oh, you just don't get it. You're full of hate. You're, you're this, you're that. You're too political. You're, you, know, you should stay out of politics. No, but I guarantee you, you know, I've had people say that to me. Pastor Hank, I, I would go to this church, but it's just too political. No, it's not. I'm, I'm here, right now, I'm in a season in this country to stand for God and for what is true. And I'm not going to allow you who had to be beat up and lied to, and put a stupid face diaper on your face, lied to about vaccinations. The only thing that got shut down was churches. And not preach to you the truth, and tell you the truth when they censor, right? They cancel you. We are in a fight. I can't be quiet, but I'm not going to slip over into gray or secular. So people say, well, we just need to keep the political out of it. Well, then who's going to stand? 
Where is there, if these are moral issues, those are going to stand up and point the, to the church and say, listen, you have got to understand these are moral issues and you have to let your voice be heard. But I guarantee you something. I've had people before in, in 20 some years of pastoring. They would tell me, well, pastor, you're just too narrow minded. And I look at some of these folks that accuse me of being that way. Their life is a mess. They're divorced today. Their children are a mess. And I've had people who do the same thing. You know why they don't want me to preach this way? There are people in this church that don't want me to preach this way. You know why? Because if I was to follow them, nine to five, and maybe a little longer, you would see just how much they are bent towards compromise. What happens is, I got up in their back door. Pastor Hank got in their business and he didn't even know it. Truth of the matter is there's somewhere in someone's life. You don't want to hear the truth. You don't want to stand for righteousness. And you don't want to go to another level of radical Christianity. The Bible says we're to be zealous for God. You know what zealous means? It doesn't mean this passive, permissive Christian that just does whatever. Because we don't want to offend anybody. That was not Jesus. Let's go to this last example, John 8. I want to show you this about Jesus. Because, you know, look at what he told the woman. John chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and here's what he said. Early in the morning he came again in the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and he taught them. Here's what he said, verse 3. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they set her in the midst, notice what they said to him. You've got to understand what they said to him and why Jesus did what he did. Master, this woman was taken in adultery and we caught her in the very what? So while it was going on. Okay, now look at the next verse. This is very important if you're going to very rightfully divide the word of truth. Now Moses in the what? Law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Stop right there. That's only partially true. They were twisting the word. And they were asking Jesus if he would have sided with this and said, oh, you're right. It does say in the moral law of Moses that such should be stoned. You are right. He trapped them. They're, they're, they were trying to trap Jesus. But Jesus held them to the true moral law. What the true moral law stated was it wasn't just one person who was caught in adultery, also the other person. Both had to come according to the moral law and stand before the priests and stand in the temple. And what they had to do, both who were caught, both who did it, couldn't be just one, so they were only bringing the woman. And Jesus didn't agree with them here. Keep reading. Look at verse 6. See, they're only doing half. They were bending it. That's what those Pharisees did. They always bent it towards their traditions, towards what they want, and excluded themselves. And this, they said, tempting him. You know why they were tempting him? Because they knew what the moral law said. Both had to be there, not one. And they, that they might accuse him. What were they going to accuse him? Oh, see, you don't even know the law. It's only supposed, it's not just one. It's supposed to be two. They were trying to trap him. But Jesus, why does he do this next act? He stoops down with his finger, writes on the ground as though he didn't even hear him. You know why he did this? This is what you did when somebody was brought in adultery. You bring both of them. You then would bring them before the priest, and the priest would stoop down and write in the sand their sin. To be open and judged before all. Pay attention. People often say, what was he writing? Why did he do this? He was staying with their moral law. He was saying, I'm writing in the sand you brought the woman, but every one of you in front of me, either you have done it with this woman or you have committed sin and adultery also. And I'm writing it because it's not morally right if I just let you accuse the woman. You are accused too. 
That's why he wrote in the sand, because that's what the tradition is. They would write in the sand, Jeremiah 17, 3. They wrote the iniquities in the, the, the soil of the earth. And they would do that in the temple. And so he wrote, because he was letting them know, I'm not going to be trapped by you. Every single one of you hip, hypocritical Pharisees have either done these sins, and he wrote it, or he wrote the fact that they probably had committed adultery with her or sin as well. Or with somebody else. Watch what happens. Verse 7. And so when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said to them, He that is without sin. Okay, now he's calling out their sin. This is why you know that he wrote what they did in the sand. In, just like they would in the temple. And he said, uh, go ahead. You that are without sin, cast the first stone. They were not allowed to render the verdict they were not allowed to stone unless there was both and they were found guilty. So now he's telling them, you're guilty. So which one of you are going to cast the first stone and who are you going to throw it at? Just the woman only? You're out of the line according to the moral law. Look at verse 8. He goes on and look at what he says. And again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground again to make it clear. Because what he's doing now, when the, when the priest would stand up, and then do it again, it was to render the verdict. It was basically to declare, here's what you've done. All right, guilty or innocent, throw the stone, the verdict's rendered, and then he would, he would write the verdict. It's done. And then they would be dealt with according to the moral law of Moses. So he wrote again. Now notice, every man knows in their heart what's right and wrong. Why did they respond this way? Because they were a bunch of heathen fools. They were hypocrites. They were backslidden, whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. Stoop down on the ground, look at verse 9. Look at what happens. And they which heard it, he didn't say anything. Being convicted by their own conscience, Pastor Doug come, went out one by one, beginning at the oldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing. What did they hear? They heard the voice of their conscience. It's in every single person. I remember one time, I don't even want to tell my mom this, but mom, I remember one time that I remember stealing something. I was like 10 years of age, and my brothers were in the store, and they were like, hey, man, let's just grab something. Let's just, let's just lift something. And I'm like, you know, I was like, what? I was like 10. And so back in those days, they made that um, uh, uh, zebra gum. Remember that? I really wanted it. It was speaking to me, <laughs> thievery and all. And I looked at it, and I grabbed it. And I'm telling you, as I was reaching for it, I heard my voice of my, my own heart say, don't do this. That is wrong. And I did it, and I carried that thing all the way home. And my brothers go, aren't you going to chew it? And I'm like, no, I'm going to go take it back. I'm going to go take this thing back. So you know what I did? I gave in to my brothers, and I pulled one out. It was the most miserable chew I ever had in my life. Every time I chomped on it, it didn't even taste good. I knew I had done something wrong. So I got home, and I went to my piggy bank, and I scraped up as much as I could, and I found a quarter. And it was more than what it cost, and I put the quarter right back in, and it kind of ripped on the side, and I went crying all the way back to Safeway. And I, and I did. God, it was a Safeway. I've been restored. And I put it back on the shelf with the quarter. So whoever bought that pack of gum not only got gum but a quarter. But my... Oh, don't act like you didn't do anything in your life. But, but you know, here's the deal. Where's Pastor Doug? Come on up here. I got to quit. <laughs> Even unto the last, Jesus was left alone, and the woman was standing missing. And notice what he told the woman. Did he get her to where he's like, hey, woman, you know, hey, I get you. Yes. Now, look at what he said. He lifted himself up, saw no one but the woman. He said unto her, where are those? Where are your accusers? In other words, they don't have any right to accuse you, even though you're guilty. Has no man condemned you? That's what he wrote in the sand. He was bringing out their, con their condemning. He was bringing out the verdict and sentence. Look at verse 11. And so he says, uh, she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said it here, neither do I condemn you. I don't condemn you. In other words, I don't have a case according to the moral law. I can't condemn you because it requires both. But not only that, I love you. I don't condemn you. God doesn't condemn any man, the scripture says. So it doesn't matter, you know, it does matter what we do, but he's not condemning us, okay? The Bible says he condemns no man. He saves us, he saved us. But look at 
and sin no more. He didn't permit it. Stand your feet. He didn't permit it. He stood and he said, look, I don't condemn you. Your sins are forgiven, but from here on out, baby, I don't want you to do this anymore. You got to repent. How many of you saw that? All right, Pastor Doug, wrap this baby up. I love you. How many got something out of that? And then next week, next week, what I plan to do is I really want to go through the New Testament and show you in peccatory and how it relates to the New Testament and how we should pray. And then we can do that. Okay. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Aren't you glad to be part of a church that you hear truth? Yeah. Amen. You can be seated for just a moment. Altar team, if you want to come up here at this point. If you need prayer this morning, our altar team is available and honored to pray with you for any needs that you might have in your life. They're here and available for you. You can make your way up here at the conclusion of the service and they'll be in agreement with you. And we see miracles here every week. Amen. Well, I don't need to say a whole lot after that message but let's do this let's just bow our heads for a moment before you leave if you're watching online or there's someone here and you might say or be thinking to yourself what pastor preached today spoke to your heart maybe you're here and you've been living a life of some compromise you haven't really gotten off the fence to serve Jesus Christ a hundred percent and you know that if you were to meet him today, there would be issues because you haven't repented. And the word tells us that there's only one way, as Pastor said, and that's through Jesus Christ. He's the only way to be saved, to have that assurance of eternal life so that you do not end up in hell when you leave this earth. And that so you can have a victorious Christian life while you're on this earth. God has a tremendous plan for each of us. And we just have to choose. He doesn't condemn us, like Pastor said, but we have to choose to walk in His plan. Unless we make the choice, it doesn't happen. Because He gave us free will. A lot of people don't understand that, but it's our choice. God does not force anyone to serve Him. We can do it of our free will. And if we do, and we step into His plan, then we step into His plan of blessing for our life and a wonderful future, including eternity in heaven. So if there's someone here today, or you're watching online and that's you, and you're saying, Pastor Doug, I need to get it right today before I leave this place. You know, I don't believe there's any coincidence or happenstance. You're here on purpose today. And I don't care if you're here as a first-time guest or you've been here for 10 years. It doesn't matter. God looks at you. He watches you. And He's here with open arms today. And He says, come to me. I'll forgive you for anything in your past. Just get it right and let's move forward. And I, it's not my intention to embarrass anyone, but it's my intention to help you to get it right. Because we want, I want people to make it on the narrow way. I want people to get there, to get it right in their lives so that they can serve Him. Find your destiny and follow God with all your heart and see how He can move in blessing in your life if you do that. Not to embarrass you, but just to help you get on the right path. I would rather be embarrassed now in front of a few people here by raising your hand when I call for it if that's what you call embarrassment. It's much better to do that than wait till the judgment day and have Jesus say, I never knew you. Don't let that happen. You're not here by mistake today. You're here because God ordered your steps. So when I count to three today, I'm gonna to ask you to make a decision by raising your hand and to say, Pastor Doug, I want prayer. I wanna make a decision that's gonna change my life. I wanna enter into the plan that God has for my life. And if that's you today, when I count to three, just raise your hand boldly. One, two, three, raise your hand. If there's someone here today and you say, I need Jesus, I wanna get it right. I've been living a life of compromise. I see two hands here. I think there's someone else. There's a younger person here and you say, I need to get on track with God. I haven't been following God with all my heart. 
Let's open up the center aisle today, guys. You, you two that raise your hand, come on up here boldly. Thank you for doing that. You know what? It doesn't matter if you're five or if you're 85. You can make a decision for Jesus Christ. Come on up, guys. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Hallelujah. Thank you for doing that. Is this mom? Yeah. And have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I have. You have? Yes. You need to get back on track? And your son? He, first he time? Has, but he, he, we, we've both been gone for a while. Okay. You both need to get back on track. That's okay. That's wonderful. You know, the Bible says that when a sinner comes back, and we've all sinned and come short, that's all of us, but when we decide to repent and come back, heaven rejoices. It's like a party in heaven. You like parties, don't you? So you're making those people that have gone on to be in heaven. Maybe your great, great grandparents are probably watching down now from heaven and they see you coming to the Lord and they say, we're rejoicing. Amen. So we're going to do this. We're just going to pray a simple prayer, just like you prayed when you first received Jesus, basically, and you're coming back to him. And if you're watching online today, you can do the same thing right where you're at, even in your home. We're just going to pray. You pray after me. Repeat what I'm saying, and we're going to make it right with God, okay? Okay, say this with me. Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that he went to the cross. He died for me, and he rose on the third day. I believe that. Father, I ask you, forgive me for sin in my life. Make me a new creature. Get me back on the road with you. And I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. And because you two prayed that, you're forgiven. You're back on the road again. Now you just jump in and serve God with all your heart. Do you live here in Omaha? Just, you live in the area? Okay. Just be back in church. Plug in. We're your family. We're here to help you get where you need to be. I'm going to ask you two to do this. Just step over here with these two on my right, your left. They'll give you some information and uh, help you with your walk. Okay, give them a hand again. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, God is so good. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, don't miss Flashpoint Monday and Tuesday night, 7 o'clock Central. And uh, Tuesday night, I believe, will be coming live from the National Religious Broadcasters Convention. And then be back in the house for midweek recharge on Wednesday night. We're going to have a pizza party here at 6 o'clock, free pizza dinner. So come on in at 6 o'clock down to the Connect Center. Plenty of room, plenty of tables. We'll feed you both physically and spiritually that night because then you can be here for the midweek recharge too and we're going to have a good time together. So God bless you. Thank you for coming. See you Wednesday night. Have a wonderful Sunday.